Great. Uh, thank you, Anurag and Veronica, for the kind invitation. And thank you all for being here to participate in this webinar. And please feel encouraged to use the uh, chat window to ask questions, because uh, it's always more fun than just being alone in my office and talking to my computer. Um, so as you heard already from Anurag, I'm at the Max Planck Institute for Chemical Energy Conversion. Um, and I wanted to just briefly uh, introduce you first to my uh, department. So we're the Department of Inorganic Spectroscopy. I'm fortunate to work with um, a relatively uh, large uh, team of really wonderful um, postdocs, PhD students, um, undergraduates, as well as technical staff. Uh, this is the last uh, picture we have when we were still allowed to gather in large groups. Um, and what you can see from the flags underneath this photograph is um, we're also a very uh, international group, which um, I think also brings a lot of um, diversity and, and, and different perspectives. Um, the other nice thing about it, though, is we aren't just um, internationally diverse. We're also scientifically diverse. So my group um, is comprised of biologists, chemists, physicists, and engineers. And it's very much my feeling that we need this diverse range of perspectives really to tackle some of the most challenging problems in energy research. And so before I get to um, the topic of today's uh, seminar, I want to give you just a brief overview of the research um, in my uh, research group. And so fundamentally, um, what we're really interested in understanding are key reactions in energy research. So how do I best store and release energy from a chemical bond? And how do I do that in the most efficient way possible? So for those of you in the audience who are chemists, you're of course well aware that this requires a catalyst to lower the kinetic barrier for that conversion. And this catalyst could be um, a heterogeneous catalyst, some sort of um, surface phase catalyst. It could be a homogeneous catalyst that a chemist synthesized in a lab, or it could be a biological catalyst found in an enzyme. Um, but when we study any one of these reactions that's important in terms of chemical energy conversion, be it nitrogen reduction or hydrogen production, water oxidation, CO2 reduction, methane oxidation. What we really want to know is on an atomic level, how does this conversion occur? And how do some metals best optimize this conversion to happen efficiently? Now at our institute, we're particularly interested in earth abundant metals because they're sustainable and we feel that's sort of a key to our energy future. But it's also one of the reasons we're very interested in looking at um, enzymes, because when we look at how biology does it, all those reactions I showed you on the previous slide, um, they're also used um, or carried out by enzymes. And um, I'm showing the, the metals that all of these enzymes use. So the hydrogenase enzymes for H2 production, nitrogenase enzymes for N2 reduction, um, the methane monooxygenase is to take methane to methanol, um, photosystem 2, which does water oxidation, and things like carbon monoxide dehydrogenase, which can take CO2 to CO. Um, and much of our focus is really on the active sites within these enzymes. I want to make it clear that the active site is where the substrate binds and is converted. But I put to the left, um, just to make it very clear, these active sites are part of larger uh, protein systems. And so when we really want to understand, we want to know on an atomic level what's happening at this active site, but also how does the whole protein system integrate to best facilitate these reactions to deliver electrons and protons at the time that we need it. And so there's really a complex system understanding that we need. And the question is, is how do we go about achieving this detailed atomic level understanding? And I think there are many different approaches, and I think there's lots of work from groups around the world contributing to these kinds of problems. In my research group, we, we focus mainly on how X-ray spectroscopy can help us reach these goals. So we use um, synchrotron facilities, or we did when we could travel to them. Now we're doing some remote beam times. Um, or we use some of our in-house built instruments where we can do absorption and emission in-house on relatively concentrated samples. And so we do x-ray absorption, as I already said, we do x-ray emission, but we also combine absorption and emission um, in sort of a two-dimensional experiment to do something called resonant inelastic scattering or resonant x-ray emission spectroscopy. 
We also use techniques like X-ray magnetic circular dichroism and nuclear resonance vibrational spectroscopy. But what we want to do is take all these X-ray based techniques and combine them with more uh, standard in-house methods um, like optical spectroscopy, EPR, Raman, and Mossbauer in order to really arrive in a more holistic picture. Um, we correlate this to computational studies and in doing so we start to try to piece out biological reactions and understand what's happening. And so today I'm going to talk about just one of the enzymes that my group works on, but one that's particularly close to my heart, and that is nitrogenase. So what I'm showing in this picture um, are the molybdenum-dependent nitrogenases. So as I already said, a protein, um, it is a system. Nothing happens all in one place. And so here you can see um, just a schematic of some of the complex machinery that's involved in biological um, nitrogen reduction. Now, the way this happens is you require minimally these two proteins. One is called the iron protein. The iron protein is where um, two molecules of ATP actually bind. They're hydrolyzed to ATP and they provide the energy to basically drive this reaction. And what happens, um, just in a very simplified picture, is that electrons come from the iron protein, so from this 4-iron, four 4-sulfur-containing four iron protein in the upper right of my slide. My apologies, my pointer is not working. Um, and then it's transferred to the protein below it. This is the so-called MOFI protein, which is 250 kilodaltons. It has in it something called the P cluster that you can see labeled there. It has eight irons, all bridged by sulfur. And from there, electrons are transferred to FIMOCO, which is the site where nitrogen is converted to ammonia. Now, what I want to point out, and we'll get back to this later, is when you look at the complexity of this, you see there's a lot of iron in this protein. There's a lot of sulfur in these protein, not just in the active sites, but also in the cysteines and the thionines. And so this is one of the big challenges is how do you get selective enough to actually see what you need to see and understand how the protein is changing. And this has been a huge challenge in nitrogenase research. Um, but because those drawings on the previous slide were a little bit small, I want to zoom in and, and let you look a little bit closer at the MOFI protein. So this is this 250 kilodalton protein I told you about it. And inside are these two active sites we talked about. On the right, we have the P cluster. This is this eight iron cluster that's bridged by sulfur. Its job is just to shuttle electrons, okay? It just does electron transfer, it doesn't do catalysis. On the left, you see FIMOCO, and this is the site of catalysis where N2 was converted to ammonia. It has seven irons. In blue, you see the capping molybdenum, and in black, in the middle, is a very unusual mu6 carbide. Now, what's interesting is that all of these components actually have um, genes that express express specific proteins that actually are involved in this assembly. So I'm not going to talk about it today, but these days, um, thanks to some of the really beautiful work of Yulin Hu and Marcus Ruby, we understand a lot about how these clusters are assembled. Um, and it also tells us that nature knows something. It knows that it has to convert the ordinary iron sulfur cluster on the right to something more complex in order to carry out more challenging chemistry. And these are the questions that really fascinate us. Um, what modulations occur in the electronic structure on going from right to left that enable this new activity? Okay, so ultimately I told you that we need eight electrons and eight protons to produce two molecules of ammonia. We're going to get back to that later because for those of you who are paying attention, you probably already noticed there's extra electrons and protons there. And those extra electrons and protons are actually thought to be part of the mechanism. Um, part of the mechanism is the obligate release of H2, and we'll get back to that later. But what we'd like to know in principle is that every step from the ground state, which we call E0, um, to each addition of electron and proton, how is this active site transformed? What is the atomic composition at every state? What's the charge distribution, the oxidation state distribution? and the magnetic coupling. And so what I'd like to talk to you um, about today is the role that X-ray spectroscopy has played and has, will hopefully continue to play in us understanding uh, the complex electronic structure of this cofactor. And so at the start, what I want to do is just take you back in time a little bit um, to some of the earliest structures of nitrogenase. So this structure actually um, for this cofactor and the protein first came out in 1992. I was actually um, an undergraduate at the time, um, finishing up my bachelor's studies in chemistry. 
And I remember this was a really exciting structure because uh, it did something that all of our chemistry textbooks told us didn't occur. The irons in this 1992 crystal structure, if you look at that on the left, they're all three coordinate. And at the time, um, we would have taught people that iron had to be minimally four coordinate. So this crystal structure actually inspired synthetic chemists to produce a low coordinate iron complexes. It opened up a whole new field. Um, interestingly though, later crystal structures showed there was density in the middle. Um, and in 2002, although there was density in the middle, we didn't know if it was carbon, nitrogen, or oxygen. Um, and I won't read through this whole slide, but I just want to emphasize that there were many um, spectroscopists and computational chemists uh, trying to understand out what this uh, central atom could be, um, but they couldn't pin it down. And at the time, I was a starting assistant professor um, at Cornell, um, and having come from uh, being a beamline scientist and having a synchrotron background, I was wondering if the new developments with these high resolution uh, emission setups that we're seeing in many, many places now, there'll soon be one um, at, at the Balder beamline at, at MAX4 that's coming pretty far along. Um, could these spectrometers actually help us solve this puzzle? Now, um, I want to emphasize this puzzle is particularly challenging for a protein because we have so many light atoms. We have so many carbons, oxygens, nitrogens. I'm not even including all the structural water. And so when we try to talk about what is that central atom, we need to characterize one out of thousands and thousands of atoms. And so why valence emission? Why did we think this was a good idea? So um, just a reminder, I know you've had some other uh, webinars already on X-ray spectroscopy, um, but X-ray emission spectroscopy, like most X-ray spectroscopy, is, is element selective. And so what we're doing is we're tuning to an energy where the probability of ionizing an iron 1s electron is very high, okay? And we ionize that to the continuum. And then we follow all the processes that occur afterwards. That could be a 2p to 1s uh, emission event uh, that generates the k-alpha lines, it could be a 3p to 1s event that generates the k-beta lines, or it could be the very unlikely event that's boxed there in red and blown up so you can see it, the idea that an electron in a filled ligand orbital could refill a 1s core hole on the iron. Now, why does this matter? It matters because the valence ionization energies of carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen are incredibly different. In fact, their 2s ionization energies differ by nearly uh, eight electron volts or so. Um, and so it, it becomes much more sensitive um, because you have an element selective way. It says this light atom has to be coordinated to the iron. And then the energy of these valence uh, ionization features are going to tell me um, something about its identity. And so this is something we, we did now um, almost a decade ago was to first demonstrate the utility of valence to core X-ray emission to identify the central carbide. And so what you can see in the left panel in the inset are these valence ligand 2s to metal 1s transitions. You can see where it appears for iron oxide in red at relatively low energy. It goes up by several electron volts to iron nitride, but it goes up even more quite significantly for the MOFI protein. And what this told us empirically, this very high uh, k-beta double prime is what this feature is called, um, it told us very likely that this was a carbide, and it was the first example of a carbide in biology, actually so far the only, although it's found in other nitrogenases as well. But this observation is only empirical, and so what we wanted to do was to also correlate it to calculations, and to best highlight what's happening in the calculations, we actually um, subtracted FEMOCO from the P cluster, because remember the P cluster was only iron sulfur, and um, FEMOCO um, had the central carbide. So to emphasize um, the contribution of that central atom, we did the subtraction. And on the right, on the top, you see the different spectrum in blue from experiment. Then in the computer, we can calculate whatever we're looking for. We could put FEMOCO with a carbon, with a nitrogen, or an oxygen. But what you can clearly see is that the blue spectrum, where FEMOCO had a carbon in the middle, is clearly in the best agreement with our experimental data, and neither nitrogen or oxygen fit. And this kind of confirms what we thought um, just empirically, right? And so 
I won't go through all of this because it's, it's more fun to talk about more recent papers, but this is sort of uh, many of the synchrotron studies that followed really focused on trying to figure out the electronic structure of the resting state of this E0 form. So we've done a lot of experiments like molybdenum and iron herft XAS. We've correlated that with Mossbauer, molybdenum LHS, and we've also done different kinds of XMCD pictures uh, to arrive at the fact that FIMOCO is best described as a MOFE7S9 carbide 1 minus cluster. Now, some people who maybe aren't into details of electronic structure say, well, why do I care like what the exact charge of this cluster is? But remember, we have to put eight electrons in um, to get this cycle to complete. And if I'm a computational chemist trying to calculate a mechanism, and I have no idea what charge state I'm starting with, this is pretty challenging. And when we started this, the charge state varied over four units of total charge. And so now we feel we've pinned this down and we at least know where our mechanism was starting. And this was really important for us to, to reach this point. There's something though I want you to look at in this drawing that you might find a little bit strange, especially uh, for the chemists in the audience. If you look at the molybdenum three, there's something really funny about it. Um, it has a, an electron configuration that goes down, down, up. So it's something that we teach doesn't happen, or we call it a, a non um electron configuration. And we were very interested um, in trying to understand why this happens. Um, based on computer studies, we believe that this is stabilized by the interaction between the iron and the molybdenum. So there's an actual bonding interaction that helps stabilize this. Um, but we wanted an experiment that actually showed us this wasn't normal molybdenum-3. And so the experiment we did was molybdenum LH XMCD. So what you see in the upper left panel of this slide are molybdenum LH XMCD data. So this is a 2P to 4D transition. And what you can see is FIMOCO in blue um, looks very similar to what is labeled MOFE3S4. This is a synthetic cubane that in all of our studies looks very much like FIMOCO and it has those same molybdenum iron bonds that I just talked about. Um, and we think it also has this non hun configuration. And then we looked at a normal molybdenum 3, this molybdenum TTCNCl3, which is a completely normal three halves. Now, if you look at just the elegies on the top panel, they all look pretty similar. They all have a maximum of about the same energy. Um, and that's all consistent with molybdenum three, but it doesn't tell me anything about the configuration of the spin. Is it three up or is it two down and one up like I drew on the previous slide? So to get insight into the spin configuration, we did um, X-ray magnetic circular dichroism where we used the difference between left and right circularly polarized X-rays. And now you can see the red and black spectrum, which looked quite similar before, um, now actually look quite different in the bottom panel. The bottom left is the experimental XMCD. Um, and on the right, I'm showing calculations. And what you can see is the calculations clearly show um, that when molybdenum interacts with iron in this bonding-like situation, you can stabilize this local one-half state. And this was something quite surprising. Um, and we found a really nice way to use um, XMCD spectroscopy to detangle complex couplings. Um, Maybe before I go on to the next part of this, were there any questions so far? I can't actually see the chat screen at all, so. Okay, uh, I think you can maybe continue. Um, <laughs> we are receiving some questions, but they always come at the very end of the talk, uh, according to our experience. <laughs> so okay. you can. That's, that's completely fine, I'll keep going. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to, one always wants to find out that you haven't like disconnected and I'm, you know, talking to my yes, yes. yes. <laughs> okay, so let's continue. Um, I, what I've really given you so far is mostly background on how we've um, really tried to deconvolute the complexity of the electronic structure in the E0 state. And one of the challenges about going to um, this protein under turnover conditions, as I already tried to emphasize before, is we have a large number of irons and a large number of sulfurs. We actually have uh, 72 sulfurs in this protein. And so one of the things that's been important to us is ask the question, can we get greater selectivity? So for instance, can we substitute selectively selenium for sulfur in order to maybe use selenium-based spectroscopy as a unique probe? 
And this is something we did in collaboration with um, Doug Reese's group at Caltech, um, with a very talented former PhD student of his, Rene Arias, and together with a postdoc in my group, um, Justin Hensorn. And this was a real uh, tour de force effort from both uh, Justin and Rene, who I think made a really um, beautiful story out of this. So let me tell you um, the background on this. So one of the things that um, Doug and his group had shown previously is that when you add potassium selenocyanide to um, nitrogenase and put it under turnover um, with um, protons, um, you basically see that the selenium selectively goes into the 2B position, shown there in green in the middle panel. And what's interesting is this uh, selenium substituted, this SE2B, still has an EPR that is similar to the resting state, um, and importantly, it still shows the same activity. So it can turn over with nitrogen, um, but when it does that, it can turn over with nitrogen or acetylene, it produces um, this variant that's shown on the far upper right, um, where that one selenium has now distributed roughly 50-50 between the 3A and the 5A positions. So it suggests that there's sort of a dynamics in this cofactor during the course of catalysis. But again, this resting form is still a three halves equals S equals three halves EPR signal. And so it seems to suggest the electronic structure isn't significantly perturbed um, by the introduction of selenium. Um, and the activity is not perturbed at all. The other thing um, that's kind of cool about this then is it allows us to use the selenium as a probe sort of to crawl around this cofactor and to say, what is the cofactor look like from the perspective of selenium 2B when the selenium interacts with iron 2 and 6 versus what does the cofactor look like from the perspective of selenium 3A and 5A, okay? Um, and then we can also um, inhibit this cofactor with CO. This generates a different EPR signal in S equals 1 half that is characteristic of what's known in the literature of low CO FIMOCO. You don't need to worry about that. Um, but what's cool is that the selenium stays in the 3A and 5A positions. So when we compare the cofactor above and below, this allows us to actually see how the electronic structure is perturbed upon CO binding. Um, and because CO only binds to more reduced states, it effectively allows us to characterize a reduced substrate, substrate bound intermediate of FEMOCO. So how are we gonna do this? The way we did this is to use selenium herft X-ray absorption spectroscopy. And so here, um, if you looked at fully reduced selenide, um, which is shown in the bottom left in black, you would see basically you have a relatively featureless edge, and this corresponds to the selenium 1S to selenium 5P transition. In HERFT, um, this is basically just a cut of a Riggs plane. What you see is spectral sharpening, and so maybe I just bump ahead. This would be the, the Riggs plane that we're actually cutting from, so we're detecting selenium K-alpha. You can see there's no off diagonals in this Riggs plane, so this means that taking a herft cut through this plane um, should give us spectral sharpening without losing any information. Now, the reason we want that spectral sharpening is because selenium is relatively high energy. It's about 12 kV, and so we see a lot of coral lifetime broadening in these spectra. Now, the selenium spectra are interesting to us because although in reduced selenide, there are no pre-edge features. Once selenium is bound to an open shell metal like iron, you start to see pre-edge features. And what I'm showing you on this slide are calculated pre-edges um, where the selenium is bound to two ferric irons, so two iron threes is shown in red. And then I'm showing you what progressively happens as we reduce those irons. And so as we populate the d orbitals of iron, the intensity goes down because there's less whole character. The energy of the pre-edge um, can also be um, adjusted to um, the selenium 1s to 5p energy, um, and this allows us to see how the iron 3 d manifold is moving relative to the selenium. And so what's effectively happening is as I increase the effective charge on the iron, the pre-edge comes down in energy because the effective charge has increased um, and the selenium 1s to pre-edge transition goes down in energy. So there are two factors, both intensity and energy, that will tell me something about um, how the iron electronic structure is changing. Now, in order to do this in a quantitative and rigorous way, we use model complexes. And so what I'm showing you here are the models that Justin made. 
And in the middle panel, you have this double cubane with a, a single selenium. Um, and then um, Justin can oxidize that by either one or two electrons. And what I'm showing you here are the pre-edges. And so you can see what happens upon oxidation. We go from black to blue to red, or the pre-edges increase in intensity as it becomes more oxidized. And we can also then align the edges like we did in our computer experiment. And you can see as it becomes more oxidized, the pre-edge is moving somewhat down in energy. Now these effects aren't huge. The intensity modulations are relatively modest. The changes in energy aren't that dramatic, but maybe that's not surprising. It's a large cluster with many irons. We expect this effect to be delocalized, but it certainly demonstrates the utility of selenium Hurt as a spectator probe for the cofactor charge. So what Justin did next many, many times, this is now the distilled version, he looked at what Fimoco looks like from the selenium herft when the selenium sits at the 2B position in blue or, the, or when the selenium is distributed between the 3A and 5A positions, which is shown in red. And what you can see is that these edges are dramatically different. I don't have to shift for you or anything. What you can see is from the perspective of the 2B, the irons look much more oxidized, but from the perspective of the 3A and 5A, the irons look much more reduced. And this is kind of a surprising finding because it suggests a much more localized electronic structure than we typically think of for iron sulfur clusters. So why might this be happening? Well, here it's interesting to just take a closer look at the crystal structure. And what we see from the crystal structure is that there are electrostatic and hydrogen bonding interactions at the 3A and 5A positions that likely localize the charge density to that iron phase. Um, there's only a single hydrogen bonding interaction in contrast to the 2B position. And so we think that favors locally more localized um, oxidized site um, at the 2,6 edge relative to the other iron phase. But this is kind of cool because it suggests these hydrogen bonding and electrostatic interactions may actually be tuning the protein environment so that one site is kind of activated for substrate binding. Okay, so let's take this a step further and look what happens when we actually have a CO bound intermediate. Now I already told you to bind CO, we have to reduce it. So this is a reduced substrate bound intermediate. But what's happened to the pre-edge? It's gone up in intensity. So recall that means we're seeing irons that effectively look more oxidized. Now why might this happen? Well, what we think is happening is for CO to bind, you may actually have redox reorganization in the cluster because if CO binds um, on this iron 2,6 phase, then you need to actually um, have more reduced irons because CO likes to back bond um, at that phase. So this actually might be giving us a hint as to what the role of the carbon is. The carbon may actually allow more facile redox reorganization as it's needed, okay? Um, and so this is something that um, we're pretty excited about. But let's take it one step further um, in the, the last part of my talk and talk about really characterizing a native E1 state. And before I do that, um, I want to acknowledge the whole team that was involved in this work. So um, at the CEC, um, this was the PhD work of um, a very uh, talented PhD student who's now doing a, a wrap-up postdoc with me. I'm very fortunate he's agreed to stay longer at Casey Van Stoffen. Um, Laura DeCounts, who is the group leader um, who leads our nitrogenase efforts in our biochemistry labs, as well as Ragnar Bjornsson and Albert Torhalsen on the computational side. And this work was done as a collaborative effort with the group of Brian Hoffman and um, his group member Roman Davidoff um, at Northwestern, as well as the group of Lance Seafelt at Utah. Okay, so you might be asking, I, I my group spent more than a decade trying to understand E0. Why didn't we study other intermediates sooner? And I basically put this diagram up to point that this is a very challenging problem to try to isolate intermediates in um, nitrogenase. And I've shown here only a sub partial cycle here. Um, and so you already saw before, um, there, there are more E states, but this is just a partial E0 to E4 state. Um, and this is what happens that in the absence of nitrogen, we can only populate intermediates E0 through E4. Now this cycle is driven by rapid electron and proton transfer. And remember those electrons are coming from the iron protein. 
And typically um, in the actual biological system, there's a large excess of iron protein to MOF feed protein in order to drive this electron transfer rapidly forward. Okay, and so the ratio of different E states that you actually get when you do this experiment in the lab depends on the ratio of MOFI protein to iron protein. Okay, and so we can vary that ratio in order to control the amount of intermediates that we actually get. So if we want to populate the early uh, E uh, intermediates, what we want to do is have very low electron flux. That means we want to have a lot more MOFI protein than iron protein. And what we find is if we go to ratios of about 50 to 1, um, we can populate a fair amount of E1. Now, how do we follow this? Before we go to the synchrotron, we monitor this by EPR. So I already alluded to the fact that the E0 has a characteristic S equals 3 halves EPR signal. And if I put an electron in, that by definition means I'll go to something that is integer spin, and at least in normal EPR, it's going to be silent. We think it's probably an S equals 2 state. So what happens is I reduce it, you see the EPR signal that was purple for the 100% E0, it goes down to about 50% of that signal. And we know um, that if we went too far and started populating E2, we would have a new S equals 3 half signal with a unique set of G values. Because that doesn't appear, it shows we've been in low enough efflux to only populate these two states and we can use EPR um, spin quantitation to get those ratios. And then later we'll use that on our XIS to deconvolute pure spectra, okay? Now, I wanna point out there's more than one way to reduce. What I showed you on the previous slide is what we call a native reduction. That means you use the protein native reductase. But one of the more popular ways to study nitrogenase intermediates has been to do cryoreduction. And this means you basically just bombard it with radiolytically generated electrons. So for those of you who've been to synchrotron beams and seen um, beam reduction, this is kind of a, a similar idea. And in fact, some of the early E1 states actually were generated um, at synchrotrons. Uh, the reason people are interested in this though is that at least in nitrogenase, it's been shown that this is a means to decouple the electron and proton transfer steps, which in biology you can't do. Um, in cryoreduction, um, they're related by annealing. So you cryoreduce at, um, at 77 Kelvin, anneal up to 200 Kelvin, and it's found that at 200 Kelvin, that's when you see uh, proton motion. At least this is what um, is believed. Um, but let me talk to you before we get to the XAS about what's known about um, the, the, these cryo-reduced states that are, that are EPR silent. So one of the best insights um, that has come to these clusters is, is through Mossbauer. And what's beautiful about Mossbauer is it's sensitive only to 57 iron. And so what you can actually do is you can extract this FEMOCO cluster from nitrogenase, 57 iron um, label, and then put it back in. Um, the 57 iron labeling actually happens on, on the level of, of the actual cell cultures, but in any case, um, it gives you a way to have a unique label on it and see only FEMOCO and not the other irons. Now what's interesting though, if you compare native reduction and look at how the, um, the isomer shift changes, so this is what's under native reduction MN to MR, you see the change in isomer shifts are relatively small on the order of 0.02 to 0.03 millimeters per second. In contrast, when you look at cryoreduction, so this is MN to the alternative MI or cryoreduced state, you see that the change in isomer shifts actually double. And this actually led the authors in this 2000 JAX paper to conclude that perhaps native reduction occurs at the molybdenum and cryoreduction occurs at the iron. And this would be really important because it would indicate that you can't use cryoreduction to understand the mechanism. And this is something we also wanted to investigate. Now, I want to point out we're not the first people to study E1 by XFs. In fact, 25 years ago, um, the group of Steve Kramer reported XFs on the E1 state. What was somewhat surprising about their XFs, however, is that they actually showed the molybdenum oxygen distances actually contracted. So this wouldn't imply reduction at molybdenum, but a contraction of 0.06 to 0.07 angstroms likely looks more like oxidation. Um, no zanes, however, were reported in that paper to, to assess whether or not it looked oxidized, and we nevertheless thought this warranted sort of reinvestigating um, the excess as well. So what is the question we're asking? We really want to know, where does the first electron go when we're thinking about the mechanism? Does it go to the molybdenum, or does it go to the iron? 
And where does the proton go? Does it perhaps actually form a hydride, which is thought to be mechanistically important, or does it maybe um, protonate a, a bridge? And can we tell? So we'd also like to understand um, whether or not cryoreduction is really related uh, to native reduction simply through annealing. This was something that the initial Mossbauer paper didn't look at what happened to the Mossbauer when you annealed. So this was something we also wanted to go back to and really figure this out. Now, one of the places we thought we had the absolute best handle was to use um, molybdenum high energy resolution fluorescence detected X-ray absorption. So again, like the selenium perf, we're now gonna use molybdenum perf. So we only have one unique molybdenum. And so if any redox is happening at the molybdenum, these edges should be sensitive. And so I just wanna point out um, here, I'm showing MOFI um, protein in black where the molybdenum is molybdenum three. I'm showing some molybdenum three model complexes in red and green. And then I'm showing a molybdenum four um, in blue. And of course, as we oxidize them, we would expect the edge to go up. And I just wanna show that even um, with these relatively large core hole lifetime droppings at molybdenum, you still expect to see significant changes. And again, only one molybdenum. So if something's happening there, we should see it. So what did we see? Here's the molybdenum perf of E0 in purple, E1 in green, and the various cryo-reduced states. I'm just showing different doses, and then also what happens after annealing at 200 Kelvin. And you can see within um, air, there's nothing happening at molybdenum. So certainly nothing to say a full redox event occurs at molybdenum. Now, what happens when we instead look at the iron? Here again, everything looks very similar. But remember, unlike the Mossbauer, where I could iron 57 label and just look at the Humoco, in this case, um, I have 15 irons that are all contributing um, in this MOFI spectrum. And so I have to actually look at different spectra, subtract E0 from E1. And I'm showing error bars here just to show that we got good enough signal to noise in both E0 and E1 spectra to believe these differences. And what you see is that E0 and the cryo-reduced really are different. These are the green for the, the natively reduced and the black for the cryo-reduced. But when I anneal it, you get the red spectrum, which shows that it's moving back towards something that looks a bit more like the native reduced. And so this at least um, provides um, some confirmation that it appears reasonable that the native and cryo-reduced are actually um, related by annealing and that in fact, um, no redox chemistry is happening at the molybdenum. But we wanted to go back and, and revisit the Mossbauer as well. Um, and so we actually contacted the authors from the 2000 paper and believe it or not, um, they actually had their original Mossbauer samples still stored um, in liquid nitrogen. So we remeasured them and reproduced values very close to um, their original paper. And then we did the one key experiment that wasn't done. We annealed to um, 200 Kelvin. And what you can see if you look at the table, the bottom line, um, of course, E0 um, subtracted from E0 gives a, a delta in the isomer shift of zero. But for the cryo-reduced, we saw a larger change of 0.07. Um, but when we annealed it, we saw a change of only 0.02. So it was identical then um, in terms of the change in the isomer shift to the natively reduced. So we've confirmed the electron doesn't go to the molybdenum. It's clearly going to the iron, but affecting only a modest change in the isomer shifts. So the next question is, can we tell where the proton goes? And here we ask, can XOS and QMMM help us find this out? And so here, um, I'll just go through this somewhat briefly. These are the molybdenum KH XOS of E0 and E1. And recall, I told you already that we get at most 50% uh, E1. So the bottom spectra that's labeled just E1, this comes from doing a subtraction. And we do this just because we're looking to see trends. That trend should increase even more if we look at the subtracted data. And what I'm showing in the right is the difference between the mixture in E0 versus our pure E1 in E0. And we don't see any particularly pronounced trends on going from black to red, except perhaps the slight change in, in the, the molybdenum iron component, but there was no evidence for significant structural changes at molybdenum. In contrast at iron, you can already see it if you look at the Fourier transform on the bottom left. Um, there are two clear um, features in E0. Um, they start to coalesce in the mixture, and by the time we get to the pure E1, they're even closer together. 
And if you look at the distance analysis, this is coming from the iron sulfur distances elongating slightly, while the short iron iron distances within the cubane are contracting slightly. So these two result in the Fourier transform coalescing ever so slightly. So even though it's only a one electron effect um, and there are many irons, the excess still evidence um, this change. Now the next question is, can we take our XF structure, correlate it to QMMM studies, and get an idea of where the proton is going on that basis? And so this is the 1,000 atom active region that we used with 133 atom quantum mechanics region. And I just want to point out that we looked at many different broken symmetry solutions, and also we modeled protonation in different ways. So what Albert did was to look at protonations that could happen at the 3A, 5A, or 2B position. He also looked at um, remote protonations from the central um, sulfide bridges. He looked at the formation of possible hydrides or even possibly protonating the central carbide, which has been proposed. And in terms of the surrounding amino acids, he also looked at different protonations, for instance, in this histidine, either at the delta or epsilon position, and how that could affect um, the structures. So what I'm showing here is our evaluation of the QMMM models relative to the average distances we got from XFs. And so this is just an RMSD. And you can see from most of the RMSDs, they're between sort of 0 0.015 and 0 0.025. Um, the only real outlier we found structurally was when you protonate that central carbide. That structure seemed way off. Um, but in addition to looking at the structures, we also evaluated um, the total energies. And we found with the histidine, if we protonated the delta position, we certainly favored um, then protonating the 2B. How if we protonated the epsilon position, um, we saw that we couldn't really distinguish either putting a proton on the 2B or the 5A was equally favorable. Um, so based on this, let me just um, summarize. Um, so on the right panel um, is the summary for this part. Um, what we saw from looking at the E1 studies is that reduction of uh, E1 occurs at iron. It actually does occur on the side of cubane closer to molybdenum, so this may explain really subtle perturbations at molybdenum. Um, and what we see experiment and theory taken together favor protonation of a belt sulfide, either the 2B or the 5A position. Um, I've also, in the first part, showed you how um, selenium substitution gives us a means to get more selective information. Um, it surprisingly shows there's a large degree of electronic asymmetry in Primoco in contrast to what we know about iron sulfur model complexes. And the selenium heft also showed that CO bound nitrogenases um, provide evidence for redox reorganization upon reduction. And so, what we're doing next is to look at other EN states. Um, possibly combined with selenium substitution, although those are really tough experiments. So I have to, again, um, applaud all my group members for the tremendous efforts they've put into this. But I hope um, all in all, whether you're interested in biolog biological catalysis or other kinds of catalysis, I hope I've shown you how much um, advanced spectroscopic approaches are needed to understand complexity really in every area of cat catalysis. And um, today I chose to focus on um, biological catalysis, but I want to just give out a shout out to one of my um, uh, recent PhD students, um, Abbas Beheshdi Askari, who uh, just uh, last week got the cover of ACS Catalysis for some of his work on um, heterogeneous catalysis using in situ sticks and nanoreactors. So if you're interested in more heterogeneous, um, I wanted to advertise that. And finally, I just wanted to thank all of my group members. I've tried to acknowledge them throughout the course of the talk. Uh, we have wonderful collaborators that I also tried to mention um, and all the uh, synchrotron facilities that gave us beam time and you for your attention and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you very much Serena. It was really great talk. Uh, so I think and you're also our first speaker really stay on time. So thank you very much. <laughs> so I think we each have my phone. <laughs> Excellent. So it's time now to go through the questions. Yeah. We received some few questions. So maybe Anur, I do you want to start? Yeah, the first question is uh, for hybrid devices comprised of nitrogenesis and uh, photoelectrodes, is it possible to differentiate or understand charge transfer at various interfaces? Um, in a hybrid device that uses the nitrogenase? Yeah. Is that the question? Yes. 
Okay, um, you know, this is a, 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 an excellent question and it's, it's been a controversial question. So um, for a long time, I, I would say people would tell you that um, you couldn't build a hybrid device with nitrogenases because it always needed its native reductase. Um, but very recently, um, there have been hybrid de devices or hybrid like materials using um, cadmium sulfide um, to, to trigger um, electron transfer. But it's very hard to uh, evaluate those systems in a controlled way because um, although you can photoactivate it, it gives an uncontrolled cascade. And yes. so it's very difficult for us to look at it stepwise. Um, but I'm sure there are other groups also working on this. I know Shelley Mentier's group has made a lot of progress um, also getting this into um, polymer-like films. So I think it's on the horizon, but we're not there yet. Uh -huh. Thank you. Okay, we have another one. Uh, is it possible to determine what type of bond breaks or form during transition from one, say, one state to another? I mean, ultimately, this is kind of our, our dream experiment, right? Is, is yes. to actually watch um, bond making and, and breaking. And so we hope that, that someday um, we'll be able to watch the NN bond become activated. Um, and we've shown this in model complexes that you can do this with valence to core X-ray emission, um, but it hasn't been done yet for, for nitrogenase. So these are are hard experiments, but I'm sure they'll be exciting and keep us busy for years to come. Yeah, it would be very interesting to see how this bond breaks and forms. Yeah, I, I think for, for many people, this would be a, a, a major goal. Yes. Okay, okay, so we have other questions. So this is more like, yeah. So what's the time scale of the observed changes in between different energy states? Um, yeah, so it's a, uh, a little bit hard to give an absolute number because it will depend on how you, you tune the electron efflux, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's, you're kind of changing it by tuning parameters, but um, these are proteins that aren't that fast. So there's many intermediates that are of interest that are generated on the millisecond to even second time scales. The bigger problem we have is, uh, reaching a configuration where we accumulate enough of a given intermediate to be able to probe it, right? Um, and that's, that's the challenge. Okay, in the audience, they thank you for the answers. <laughs> so we continue with the next question. So what are the minimum information we need to, uh, from our typical labs uh, before going, before seeing these pieces with x-rays? So yeah, I mean, in the audience, there might be people that are not uh, familiar with this type of uh, technique. So I suppose they are interested in knowing uh, what they need to do before. Yeah, so, you know, this, like that. yeah, it's a great question to ask before you think about going to a synchrotron. Um, I, <laughs> I mean, I think that um, it, it will depend a bit on your system, of course. Um, but I think that whenever you have, um, you know, open shell paramagnetic metals, it's nice to look at EPR when possible. For almost anything that's an inorganic system and colored, it's good to verify how things change by UV vis. I think that people understand that different laboratories have access to different levels of infrastructure and information, right? So I think um, it's good to reach out and collaborate, not just with the synchrotron scientists, but with other spectroscopists that can help you, right? I think that's, it's, uh, these are complex questions that are best tackled by a global community. And I don't think there's a, a box you can tick off and say, I minimally require this because it's different for every system, right? Yeah. But. Okay, so we have the last question, which is also the longest. So I will break it in a short questions. So, First of all, he, wants to, he says, thanks for a very interesting talk. It's always amazing to see what can be achieved from the synergy of different exper uh, expertise. So I'm wondering how one of your synchrotron experiments would look like. So what's the state of the aggregation of your sample and its medium? First question. Okay. Maybe you can answer to this I'll question. answer that first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's um, a, an excellent um, and important question for us. For most of our biological samples, um, they're prepared as solutions. 
Um, so they might be uh, freeze quenched if, if it needs to be um, trapped on a, a short time scale or if it's just a, a native resting, we would just freeze it in liquid nitrogen. And then it's transferred from liquid nitrogen to a helium cryostat and measured at low temperatures, typically um, either rastering or, or moving many spots because of, of possible damage. Um, we are looking towards doing flow studies in solutions with these proteins. That brings, obviously, other challenges. Yeah, in fact, the following questions are, do you actively change any sample conditions besides temperature? Also, is radiation damage a problem? So interestingly, so radiation damage is, for anyone who works in the bio biology realm, it's a nightmare for us. Um, it, uh, but interestingly, um, it varies a lot by protein as well. Um, so if you look at something like the, the photo system, uh, <laughs> that's, that's probably the, the nightmare of, of photo reduction problems. Um, and interestingly, nitrogenase, uh, we find, is less susceptible to reduction. It will eventually change in the beam, so we don't dwell. Um, the, the dwell time will depend on, on the dose uh, per spot, um, but we have, I would say, dwell times that are order of magnitude longer than what's possible for photosystems.